Today is the 20th anniversary of the release of The Phantom Menace, so we are going to celebrate the film. We're going to talk about our favorite scenes or characters or aspects of the movie, and then we invited a bunch of our friends in the fandom to do the same. So buckle up. This is probably going to be a pretty long video. A lot more people said yes than I thought we're going to, which is great. My heart is very full of how many people just wanted to talk about this movie. So uh, let's get to it. The Phantom Menace is the first Star Wars movie I got to see in a theater for the first time. I mean, I saw the special editions in the theater, but, you know, I watched them on TV first. So I got to experience this one for the first time on a big screen. I wore a Jedi robe. I had a little white lightsaber. Aww. We went for a friend's birthday. Uh, I have so many good memories of this movie. And I was 12 when I saw it. And I was just the perfect age for that movie as a Star Wars fan. Like, I got into it when I was about eight or nine. And then, like, the special editions were coming out. And I knew there was another one on the way. And then it came. And, like, you know, for a kid, it lived up. Yeah. I walked out of that theater loving it. I loved Darth Maul and the Duel of Fates, of course. I loved pod racing. I thought Jar Jar was funny and fine. Uh, but my favorite scene that I'm going to go with is... Pilot related. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, when Anakin blows up the Trade Federation droid control ship uh, and he's flying out of the hangar. I don't know why, but every time all those pilots are like, look, one of ours out of the main hold and like Anakin's doing his woo and then, like all the other guys are. Yeah. <laughs> one guy just does this like, yeah, like, I don't know why. I just got chills recreating that scene. Like, I love that scene and just seeing the pilots uh, succeed at what they were trying to do in this desperate battle. So uh, that's what I'm going to say is my favorite scene in The Phantom Menace. For some reason, the scene that sticks out in my mind as a 12-year-old at the time is when we find out that there's a hidden city, the Gungan City, in a lake. Like when Jar Jar takes them to the Gungan City and they put on those little masks that make them able to breathe underwater which at the time i was like that was my goal in life is to like still awesome yeah it's just, they just fit in your pocket it's amazing be a mermaid for <laughs> forever um but yeah they just like go into the water they swim down and then there's this just huge hidden city under the water and it's it's so cool well, it's beautifully shot well, now you've heard from us, so we're going to throw things over to our friends in the Star Wars fandom so they can give you all their takes. If you aren't familiar with any of these people, I'm going to put their information up on the screen, and I'll put links in the description. So be sure to check all these people out if you like what they have to say and you want to hear more from them. Ever since I first saw the movie as a kid, I've always loved the final scene of The Phantom Menace, as in the celebration on Naboo right before the end credits but it wasn't until the past few years that I realized what it was that I loved about it. To me, Star Wars is a mythological cycle, with similar elements and stories returning in each generation. And this is the scene that best embodies that. It's the prequel trilogy's version of the throne room medal ceremony at the end of A New Hope. The final shot mirrors it, a wide shot with the whole cast assembled facing the camera. But it looks and feels completely different. The costumes are decorative and colorful, there's confetti in the air, the setting is an extravagant alien city, it's a bright sunny day. John Williams' score here, a mix of percussion and children's choirs, sounds completely unlike any of his previous Star Wars music. This is the scene that captures the promise of the prequel trilogy. It's clearly Star Wars, it mirrors the original trilogy in certain ways, but it's a different generation of the mythology with its own look and feel. Like the tagline says, every generation has a legend, and this scene feels like a declaration. This is this generation's legend. Also, for the past 20 years, I've been wondering what exactly that glowing orb is. Is there like a spin-off novel that explains that somewhere? One of my favorite parts of The Phantom Menace is a couple of awesome moments sandwiched between the super rad fight scenes. You've got these dudes fighting it out and Sloby one is trying to catch up and then these barriers come down and they're like, golly, what is this? Some kind of tension building device? Oh yeah, that's pretty dang tense. You've got the Jedi Master, the young Padawan, and the super evil Sith Lord trapped just a few feet away from each other. And what each character does 
in these moments says so much about them without any words being uttered. Obi-Wan's an eager beaver up on his feet. Maul is stalking back and forth like some kind of Satan hyena. Qui-Gon pops a squat, shuts his eyes, and starts meditating. Qui-Gon doesn't always gel with the rest of the Jedi Order, but everything he does here kind of embodies what Jedi are supposed to be. Like, uh, peace and serenity and oneness with the Force in the middle of the fight for his life. Meanwhile, the passion and anger and everything that drives the Sith are embodied by Maul as he prowls back and forth waiting to kill this son of a gun, which he does. It just felt neat that there is this moment that really shows what the Jedi and Sith are all about besides what color their lightsabers are. And the fights were pretty cool, I guess. He's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, bing, bong, bang, boop. Anyway, that's my second favorite scene. This one's my favorite. <laughs> The Phantom Menace is 20 years old, which is insane because I can vividly remember going to see it the day it came out. I'm an old man now. But uh, uh, I know everybody's talking about their favorite moments. Um, I have the same as everybody else, probably, you know, things like Darth Maul and, and you know, all those obvious things. So I, I and nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying. I want to go with something a little less obvious I love things like Easter eggs, nerdy little Easter eggs, and there's one in The Phantom Menace that I wrote a little song about. In the Phantom Menace during the Senate scene, there was a pot of ETs and one of them was Senator Greebleeps. I'm being serious, that's what they named him. And that's just Spielberg backwards. That E.T. was just Spielberg backwards. Gree bleeps, Spielberg. I like it. Hey, Cat Knapsack here, and you want to know my favorite scene from The Phantom Menace? There's actually a lot to choose from. And yeah, there's a lot of silly scenes in The Phantom Menace. We get there, but we're celebrating 20 years of this movie. And one of my favorite scenes is not a scene that I would have named in 1999. It's one that has grown for me over time, and that is when Queen Amidala decides to go back to Naboo. I love this sequence. Amidala deciding to go back to Naboo is true to her character. It's a, it's a testament to this powerful queen willing to fight and die by the side of her people. It also shows us a little bit of darkness. I do believe Palpatine, just like the emperor he grows up to be, uh, foresees things. But this is a moment. Remember, Palpatine has said early on, you'll find controlling uh, uh, Padme, Amidala, will be easy. She's young and naive. Uh, controlling her will not be a problem. Don't worry about her. But in this moment, he cannot control her. She decides for herself to go back to Naboo. And I think he right away, uh, you know, flips it around. Oh, don't go there. You'll be safer here. They'll force you to sign the treaty. She's not going to sign that treaty. I think he's able to play that because that's what Palpatine is, is doing. But Ian McDiarmid plays this one moment, the look on his face. It's a flash in his eyes of panic. If she's doing something I didn't quite plan for, and I love that second. It's a second, but it's there. He quickly recovers, but it's a testament to Amidala, her independence, uh, how she is as, as a leader uh, and a queen, and I, and I really love that. And uh, it sets Padme and Palpatine up for a rivalry for a very long time. And in the Clone Wars animated series, that plays out as well. Great stuff in the Mina Monteri arc where Palpatine at the end of the episode, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, good old Padme, good old Amidala, once again, thinking on her own, causing problems for me. And Palpatine knows she, he needs Padme. He needs Anakin's connection and attachment to Padme, but she's always kind of a wild card, and Palpatine feels as though she's a bit of a rival. And I, I think it all starts here at this scene. That's my favorite scene from The Phantom Menace. Hi, this is Charlotte from the Sky Talkers podcast, and... The reason why I love The Phantom Menace is a lot of reasons. One, Padme and the Handmaidens, amazing, iconic. Two, it completely recontextualized the way we look at the saga and the way we watch the original trilogy. And for that reason, it remains so, I don't know, prevalent to our film discussion when we talk about the Star Wars now. And um, it's just fantastic. And happy 20 years to The Phantom Menace. 
Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slatter. The Phantom Menace came out in 1999. I was 7 years old and beginning to hit my fevered love of Star Wars. That being said, I didn't know there were prequels coming out, and I certainly didn't know anything about the movie until I saw the first trailer. And I still remember that trailer. I was at the movies with my mom, I don't remember which movie, but there was a rolling green hill with a tank driving over it. Once I saw the Gungan force fields and heard the music, I knew it was a Star Wars movie. Movie, and I remember my mom being surprised that I was so perceptive. This was actually the second trailer released for The Phantom Menace. I don't know how I missed the first one, but that's just what things were like back then. After that, I just remember the sheer mania of it all. News stations covering it on TV, everyone who had a birthday in the few months after the movie came out went to go see it, the KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut integrations, basically everything. Because when I was first introduced to Star Wars, it was at one of its dips in popularity the early 90s. So it was really cool for me that something I loved was universally popular and everyone was into it. I quite liked the movie, especially because I saw it so many times, and I think it will always have a special place for me. My favorite scene was, funny enough, the trip through the planet core, and I even had a little handheld video game where you could try to escape from sea monsters as Obi-Wan. Very cool. My favorite part about episode one is that I got to see it in theaters when I was just nine years old when it came out. So I feel like I got to experience what a lot of the original trilogy folk got to experience by seeing it in the movies and I got to experience that as well. So prequels for me were very, very special. Now that being said, I would have to say I think pod racing is probably one of the coolest things to ever hit the big screen and especially when you're nine years old and you love cars and engines. Uh, the sound of those just whizzing by you and the surround sound is just very, very special. And of course, Darth Maul, the coolest Sith that ever existed. And third, I would have to say, I know there's just one, sorry Alex, the, the third would have to be the fact that Qui-Gon Jinn is in the movies and he is my number one favorite Jedi. And uh, yeah, he was just a great, great character and I can't wait to see more that Star Wars has to deliver for him. So, thanks. Hey Andy. Well, hello. You caught me watching the trailer for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. This movie turns 20 years old today, um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about my favorite scene in the entire movie. Uh, this is the scene where, as a kid, you know, it never really resonated with me, never really meant much to me, never thought twice about it. But as an adult, and after countless rewatches, uh, it means a lot to me. And I'm talking about the scene of Anakin leaving Tatooine and his mother behind to become a Jedi. This is an incredibly bittersweet moment for us, the viewers, and the character. You know, he's been a slave his entire life. It's just been him and his mom on Tatooine. Um, so this is an incredibly humanizing moment for the character where, you know, if we look ahead to the terrible atrocities that, you know, he eventually does as Darth Vader, we can always look back to this moment as a very humanizing moment. Um, it's incredibly bittersweet. Um, his mother even says, tells him to not look back, don't look back. Um, and John Williams' score is just perfect throughout. It's just, it hits all the right notes. It's just the best. Um, also, when Jar Jar steps in poop is also really good. Hi, Alex. Hi, Molly. Laura here from Force Toast Star Wars Happy Hour. And my favorite scene in The Phantom Menace has to be Anakin's departure from Tatooine. So Qui-Gon Jinn comes to Anakin Skywalker and his mother and tells them that Anakin's been set free. And it begins this great emotional moment in the film. Young Anakin is free, he's pumped, he gets to come with Qui-Gon on a starship. And in that excitement, it takes him a few minutes to kind of grasp what that really means. But Shmi, on the other hand, immediately understands what it means. And you can see that on her face. And it's this mix of sorrow, but with like, a subtle relief and it's just really tragic and super brilliant acting by Pernilla August. But shortly after we see Anakin walking away from his home and he pauses between Shmi and Qui-Gon and I want to shout out the use of lighting in this scene. Anakin is nine years old, he hasn't even begun his training yet, and the struggle between the light and the dark has already begun for this kid and you can see a subtle hint of that in the way this scene is lit. It's very cool. but. Anyway, Anakin runs back to his mother and he hugs her one last time and she tells him to be brave and don't look back. And that's the last thing she says to him in this film. And it's part of a longer, more drawn out goodbye between them and Qui-Gon knowing what he knows about the Jedi's policy on attachments just lets it play out. He doesn't 
try to hurry them along or stop them. Um, it's a very emotional goodbye between mother and son, and it's just beautiful. And I think this is the emotional peak of the film, and it's probably the reason I love it so much. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it today, and I uh, hope to see you both at another Star Wars trivia very soon. Cheers. I have a sneaking suspicion that my favorite moment from The Phantom Menace is a lot of people's favorite moment from The Phantom Menace. That high-octane, kinetic lightsaber fight between Maul, Qui-Gon, and Obi-Wan. We had never seen anything like that in Star Wars before. Sure, I prefer the more patient-paced, deliberate strikes and the realistic sword fighting techniques found in the original trilogy, but when I first saw a three-way lightsaber fight with insane explosive motion and ferocity, I was completely blown away. Duel of the Fates, of course? That's song turns the sequence up to 11. Normally, I prefer my lightsaber fights to act as a backdrop for dialogue, but this was awesomely different. The Phantom Menace soundtrack is on another level as well. One of my favorite memories attached to the movie is using that soundtrack in little stop motion animated movies I used to make with my action figures and my family's giant shoulder mounted camcorder. I'd move an action figure's leg a little bit, capture a frame. I'd move their arm a little bit, capture another frame, and when it was all said and done, I would take that tape, pop it in the VCR, and layer on some Phantom Menace soundtrack music. Good times. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years. I was only a few days from turning 13 when the movie came out. I remember the hype. I remember the buzz. And that hype and buzz has never left me. Happy birthday, Phantom Menace. I mean, I kind of have to say Darth Maul versus Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, especially when the doors open up the first time, um, because it's just such an epic scene that I, I think most people put at the top of the list. But if we exclude that one and go to something that maybe not a lot of people would pick, I actually think the scene where we first get to see Coruscant is really cool, because I really enjoy world building in these movies, and I think that's something that I think the prequels does a fantastic job of. And Coruscant is obviously such a crucial part of the Star Wars universe, kind of the center of everything. And so getting to see Coruscant the first time, and then explaining how it's basically a... Well, the entire planet is a city. Uh, it was something that always stuck with me, especially since the Coruscant is so... Uh, well, it's shown so much in episode 2 and 3 as well. So... Except for battle scenes, and similarly, I do think that the scene with Coruscant might be one of my favorites in uh, The Phantom Menace. Hey everybody, I'm Daniel from Space Dock, and this is my favorite scene in Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Queen Amidala calls for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. Probably not everyone's favorite scene, but certainly mine. Because despite a million opinions to the contrary, I love the politics scenes in the Star Wars prequels. I grew up on these films, and I grew up on pre-prequels, expanded universe content, Knights of the Old Republic, Darth Bane, the Stark Hyperspace War, and all of the other ancillary material. And that kind of imparted on me this awe in what the Republic is, this thousand generations old galaxy-spanning democracy. And here we are, at the start of this prequel trilogy, watching the first step towards warping this great and ancient nation into something far more sinister. This is Caesar crossing the Rubicon, and it's the kind of thing that can only be achieved by nature of being a prequel. We know what's coming, we know the Empire is on the horizon, and though we don't know his plan in detail just yet, we know what Palpatine is trying to do here. Any scene that leans on Ian McDermott's Palpatine performance is always great. The man is an absolute legend. It always irritated me that the tale of Darth Plagueis the Wise scene from Revenge of the Sith became such a meme, because I think it's one of the best pieces of acting and dialogue writing in the entire Star Wars saga, but what will be at its apex in that third film is being set up now, and while The Phantom Menace can reasonably be argued as less important to the overall story than even Attack of the Clones, as it's set so much earlier, the one contribution it makes to the greater picture that makes it so invaluable and so worthwhile is to see these early stages of Palpatine's plan in motion. We know that Amidala is a strong leader who has so far refused to bend to the Trade Federation, which is why it's so malevolent and insidious of Palpatine to deliberately exploit her dedication to her people in this desperate time to set himself on the path to chancellorship and the Republic on the path to destruction. And not only the actual story being delivered in this scene, another thing that I really love here is that this is, I believe, our first look at the Senate Dome and the heart of the Republic's political structure on Coruscant. This room's design
design is incredible. The floating hover platforms for the various delegates from a thousand worlds, the column in the center with the chancellor and his various advisors. This looks like the beating heart of a galactic republic. Everything that happens in this room carries so much weight. It communicates the dominoing implications of these decisions so well. When the Star Wars prequels are at their best, they feel like something out of a history book. They're less of a straightforward, heroic character story like the original trilogy, and more of a melancholy, last days of Rome kind of political story that is driven by personal character tragedy. I will happily defend the prequels politics scenes to any naysayers, as I think it's just gripping to see how this massive super nation works and how one ambitious and intelligent individual can take a million tiny actions to slowly bend it to his own will. That is why this is my favorite scene in The Phantom Menace. One of my favorite scenes in this movie is right after Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon escape from that gas room on the Trade Federation battleship, and they head over, and they're trying to break into the room with the Pneumoidians, and Obi-Wan sets up point, and he's, you know, he's blocking beams here and there. He's protecting Qui-Gon, which is already cool enough, right? We've never really seen two Jedi fight together, uh, but but the, the thing to me that really made this scene is Qui-Gon then using his lightsaber to try to cut a hole through these doors. And I don't know if they did that stuff in like the expanded universe or anything like that. But to me, that was the first time I ever saw that or even thought it was possible. And there's something really cool about like when he pulls it out and goes back in right to the center and he's just trying to like cut through the whole thing and they have this like you can see the determination on his face as they're like Spielberg panning in to dun 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 and it's like oh my gosh like this just got real so fast and uh I just I I I love that and I I love the oh it's just so good I can't even it's just so good Hey everyone, it's Lacey, and my favorite scene from The Phantom Menace has to be at the end when Darth Maul comes out in the hangar with the double-sided saber in front of Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi. That is the most epic scene in that movie, and the music picks up, you finally see him in all his glory. It's awesome, even down to the moment where they're like, okay, I guess we'll take this guy on, and Padme turns to, <laughs> turns to her group, and she's just like, we'll take the long way. It's just everything about that scene is awesome, and we watched it recently on the Resistance broadcast, and we were all like, this is the scene, because it's just, it's so exciting. There's no better villain, I think. One of the top villains is Darth Maul. He's just so evil looking and so awesome. And he was in so much of the marketing for The Phantom Menace. So to finally get to see him like really battle Jedi was just so cool. And it will always be my favorite scene in that movie. The Phantom Menace, my favorite moment from The Phantom Menace. Um, I would... Normally, probably say the lightsaber duel at the end of the movie, but I have to go with the pod race. And the reason behind that, after thinking about it for a while, is George Lucas did a lot of fan service callbacks, 3, 3PO being wedged in there, R2 being thrown in there, a lot of callbacks to tie people, fans, back to the original trilogy so they get that nostalgic feel. It still feels like Star Wars, even though it was 20, 30 years ago. But the pod race is a callback to George Lucas himself. He's such a big race car fan, a racing fan. He wanted to inject that part of his life, things he personally loves that isn't Star Wars, into Star Wars. And I just think that is so cool. And it harkens back to one of his first movies, American Graffiti, which involves street racing and drag racing. And I know for a fact that everything that went into making that scene probably made him happier than anything he ever did in Star Wars. So I have to say, without a doubt, that the pod race itself has to be my favorite scene from The Phantom Menace, let alone just from a fan, from a visual and, and audio perspective with the sound effects and the special effects and everything like that, but the fact that I know George Lucas probably loved that so much, and it was him showing another side of his life in his own franchise. Thanks. My favorite scene in The Phantom Menace isn't so much a scene as it is a sound, specifically this. There is a subtle difference to the way lightsabers sound in The Phantom Menace when compared to the rest of the saga. Whereas all the other sabers before and since have generally sounded the same, with one obvious exception, there is something auditorily unique about the lightsabers in the first prequel film. I don't know what supervising sound editor Ben Burtt that's 
him right there in a cameo, did differently when he crafted the lightsaber sound effects for this film. But to my ears, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan and Maul's sabers all seem to have that cumbersome weight Lucas described when he first created the weapon in A New Hope. You can feel these laser swords cut through the air as they ignite. There's this cylindrical electrical pop when the blades cut through a battle droid. And when two sabers meet, the sound is two electric plasmatic solid striking, which I suppose is a weird phrase, but that's only because there is no other way to describe it. Compare that to the sounds of Obi-Wan and Vader's saber striking, or Luke and Vader's, or even Anakin and Obi-Wan's. If there's one thing I wish had been consistent throughout the prequel trilogy, it would have been the sound they crafted for the lightsabers in The Phantom Menace. It gave us a sense that the Jedi were truly at the height of their power, that there was a craftsmanship that was lost after they fell. And as we approach the end of the Skywalker saga, that auditory difference between the Jedi's lightsabers and Kylo's erratic spinning cross sword subtly hammers home the idea that this is not only a story of generations trapped in the cycle of good versus evil, but also how so much can be lost when we forget our ideals and how every generation, no matter their bloodline, should keep fighting for them. Hey there, my name is Van William. I'm a singer-songwriter here in Los Angeles. Thank you so much to Alex and Molly for inviting me to be a part of this awesome celebration of The Phantom Menace. I was in eighth grade when The Phantom Menace came out. I saw it in the theater 13 times. I spent all my summers on Kodiak Island in Alaska, and it was the only movie playing on the island for two weeks, and I saw it every other day. My friend Mike and I filmed an elaborate parody version with action figures wrapping Palpatine in saran wrap to get that authentic hologram look and creating some stunning state-of-the-art stop-motion sequences. Years later, while I completely understand the criticisms of the film and currently place it in the coveted number six spot in my live action Star Wars movie rankings, in many ways, it's the most important movie of all of them for me. It catapulted me into this wild and beautiful world of Star Wars. And not to mention there are legitimately some great things about it as a film. The worlds of Oda Gunga and Coruscant are breathtaking and far surpass anything in the newer movies. The narrative is clear and it moves quickly. The Battle of Naboo is impeccably shot. Plus I just love how bold it is and weird. My friend Forrest said something that resonated with me about The Phantom Menace. It's the purest and most uncut George Lucas we may ever get. And I love it for that. For my favorite scene, I'm going to go with the first Jedi Council sequence on Coruscant. I love the tension between Qui-Gon and the others, which has even more weight to it now after reading Master and Apprentice. The background scenery is low-key gorgeous, and Yarel Poof is just straight up hoofing it up all over the place, and it's just the best. He's the absolute best. Look at him go. Poof. Just poofing. Hi, I'm Heath Williams, co-host of the Rogue Padron Podcast, and I would be remiss to let the 20th anniversary of The Phantom Menace pass by without honoring the undeniable star of the movie, the Queen of the Council, Yaddle. Her very existence is a miracle of late 20th century filmmaking. With no one around him to say no, George Lucas's ideas were running wild. What I'm assuming was a days-long bender, George took a Yoda puppet, slapped a wig on it, and named it Yaddle. She doesn't speak in the film, and we only see her fleetingly, but oh, those fleeting glances, enough to make your heart flutter for hours. The luscious locks, the salty judging looks, Yaddle is everything we could have asked for in the second on-screen appearance of Yoda's species. Why does he get to be the namesake anyway? Nearly 20 years before Constable Zuvio was robbed of his chance to be one of the great background characters in the history of cinema, Yaddle showed us all the incredible power of a great background character who's seen only in frames, but remembered forever. Yaddle walked so Zuvio could run. Looking back on The Phantom Menace, is it the best Star Wars film ever made? In my opinion, no, but it does have one of my favorite lightsaber duels. Being a martial arts, I gravitate to these aspects of the film, and not only is this duel between Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Maul, 
my favorite part of The Phantom Menace. It's my favorite lightsaber duel out of the entire prequel trilogy. Personally, I think the choreography in this duel is more effective when you compare it to episodes two and three. The opponents seem to be swinging at each other rather than striking the air between them. And I think it really helps to have a talent like Ray Part opposite the actors because he just elevates the choreography that much more. And I've really come to appreciate the way that this duel is shot the more I watch The Phantom Menace. Having this duel shot in wide, long takes with fewer cuts really helps the audience appreciate the choreography. And I think one of the greatest things that you get out of this duel is that you see the difference between all the characters when they get separated by the force fields leading into the generator room. You see how eager Obi-Wan is as a Padawan learner compared to just like the, the patient zen that Qui-Gon Jinn exudes as he meditates while waiting for the field to go down. And then of course, having Maul pace back and forth like a caged animal is just so perfect. And on top of all that, you pair this with the brilliant score of John Williams with Duel of the Face, one of the best pieces of Star Wars music ever put to the screen. And that's just a nice cherry on top to an already awesome scene. Hello, my name is George and I run Veer's Watch. My favorite scene from The Phantom Menace, or at least my favorite scene right now, comes during the final duel between Darth Maul, Obi-Wan, and Qui-Gon. And it's when, you probably know what I'm talking about, the scene when they're separated by the energy barriers and you know, Obi-Wan's a ways back, but Maul and Qui-Gon are right next to each other. And you know, Qui-Gon, you know, he starts meditating and Maul starts pacing you know, furiously. And I always loved this um, for a few reasons. Um, it really shows how the ideologies of the Jedi and the Sith you know, veer off from each other. You know, beyond just you know good and evil, the Jedi are at peace with what you can't control, and you know, Qui Gon just kneels, he meditates, he's you know serene, at one with the Force, and Maul he fuming at what he can't control, and he starts pacing, just impatient, right? you know, get back to the fight, um, and it's it's great characterization beyond the whole you know Jedi Sith. It's great characterization for Qui Gon and part of Maul's only characterization in The Phantom Menace, realistically speaking. Um, you know, Maul just impatient, wanting to get back to this fight, almost animalistic. And then Qui-Gon, again, like I said, peace, calm, serenity. Um, it's, it's really just a great little beat in the middle of a phenomenally choreographed fight, and I've always really, really enjoyed it. My favorite scene in The Phantom Menace is definitely when Padme addresses the Senate, for a couple different reasons. Um, first one being, obviously, Padme is a huge fan of mine and has been ever since she was first introduced in this movie. Uh, because, I mean, she's a teenage girl who's queen of an entire planet, has a bunch of really cool handmaidens, and, like, these really awesome gowns and costumes, so what's not to love? But in the, scene, the Senate scene in particular, uh, watching her, this tiny diminutive woman, in this huge cavernous Senate hall, you know, argue so fiercely and passionately for her people and for um, people to do what's right uh, is really, really cool to see. Uh, you know, the phrase, I will not defer, really just sums her up as a person because she's, you know, someone who's not going to let anything or anyone stand between her and what's right. Uh, but also, I just really love because that scene in particular sort of emphasizes that the prequels really did a great job in fleshing out the um, the visual language of Star Wars and really enhancing it and really adding to the world building and showing, um, you know, so many new cool locations, so many new cool aliens and uh, and costumes and all sorts of wonderful, interesting detail that we just didn't get before. And seeing the subtlety with which uh, Palpatine begins climbing his way into power and into um, the Emperor that we know him as, it's just a really cool, like, moment. And, you know, having it be, like, so more subtle and, and laying the groundwork for what's to come is really, really cool because, you know, obviously as the audience you're sitting there and you're just like, no, 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 don't, don't vote him into power. But, you know, that's the irony of the prequels and that's why they're so much fun to watch. Hi, my name's Sean Fallon. And I'm Matt Grant, and we're from Blue Bantha Milk Co. And our favorite moment of the Phantom Menace is the pod race scene. Uh, specifically for me, um, I'm a big fan of the sort of five minutes before the race starts, where you've got the um, the two the two headed commentator sort of talking about everyone there. You get like shots of the crowd, um, all these different alien races. It's kind of a cool. Um, Star it's very Star Wars -y. It, it it's it's like the Mos Eisley scene or Maz's castle or Canto Bite where it's just a chance for like the, the special effects people and the makeup people and the models and the monsters. Um it's just cool and I find uh it's incredibly surreal and incredibly funny. And there's loads of cool world building and, and finally I think the thing I like the most is Jabba the Hutt coming out and he's sort of um 
like a Pablo Escobar man of the people. He's like, he's put this race on and I like that. And that's cool. I'm also thinking about the pod race and slightly different part of it and slightly different reasons, but it's actually once the race starts that overstuffed, overlong, <laughs> incredibly tedious in some respects pod race, but also absolutely gripping. Mm. Like I remember when it came out, it seemed to me kind of like a chance for uh, Lucasfilm and uh, Industrial Light and Magic to really kind of prove that they had something kind of special going on there. And if you look at the special effects compared to even some of the stuff that's still coming out 20 years later, it is awesome. And I remember being in the cinema at the time when it came out and seeing that scene for the first time and it was just jaw dropping. Like the, the sound design alone mm. just blew my mind. Hello, Yoda Bauer here from Port Haven, the Star Wars Refuge, uh, to talk about my favorite scene in Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. And I gotta say, my favorite scene is actually the very beginning, or at least the very first scene with dialogue. Uh, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are walking into the Trade Federation ship and they have a little bit of a back and forth. But the reason why that is my favorite scene uh, is a little bit quirky. See, one of my best friends in the whole world, she and I are huge Star Wars fans, uh, prequel fans, We've always bonded over Star Wars ever since we were little kids. And one day we were playing, messing around, walking in the woods as kids do. And we got a little bit turned around. And I just said, I have a bad feeling about this. And without communicating or agreeing on it or planning it out, she responded, I don't sense anything. And I said, well, it's not about the mission, Master. It's something elsewhere, elusive. And she said, don't center on your anxieties, Obi-Wan. And we, we literally said the entire scene line for line without missing a beat of uh, recreated the whole thing there walking through the woods uh and then when we got done we had a we had a big old laugh about it when we realized what we had done and to this day i can't watch the phantom menace without thinking about that time that we were walking in the woods and it, it just makes me happy and i think sometimes with star wars you know you can have something that resonates with you because it, it speaks to you or it's just really darn cool. Uh, but Star Wars also has this way of coming alive in our lives and, and really m forming memories uh, in, in these unique ways. And because of The Phantom Menace, you know, I have this great memory with one of my best friends. And that's, that's something really special that, that Star Wars can do. Hey, this is Blaine Gibson from Rooster Teeth Productions in Austin, Texas, and my favorite part of The Phantom Menace is probably the first five or ten minutes. You know, this is the uh, first time we see Obi-Wan as a young man, you know, Alec Guinness's character and what he was like in his prime, uh, or I guess before his prime and he was still an apprentice, and then you see uh, Qui-Gon, his master, and then really I feel like this is like the first time that you see a Jedi at full force. You know, sure, Luke is a, you know, a knight by the time that, uh, Return of the Jedi rolls around, but you know, this is the first time that you see the Jedi in full force, you know, and they're dealing with these trade negotiations and then, you know, shit hits the fans and the droids start attacking them and then like, you know, you see him, you know, hitting the laser bolts and just like fucking blasting them back and then, uh, you know, they try to poison them and they hold their breath and stuff and they're this really formidable force, you know, it's really scary to the, uh, to the Trade Federation guys. Um, I think this is also the only instance that you see force speed used. So they're like basically space superheroes. Um, so it's cool. It's just like a, an awesome way to start out the prequels because you're you know setting the pace for what the Jedi are. You know they're kind of kind of like space cops, peacekeepers of the galaxy. So apparently the entirety of the Phantom Menace and every scene that Padme's in. Those don't count as my favorite scene in The Phantom Menace, even though I love that movie to pieces. And because I probably shouldn't go on an hour-long rant about how much I love Padme and the Handmaidens, I have decided that my favorite scene in The Phantom Menace has to be, Your Honor, I am Queen Amidala. Because the first time I saw that that scene, I'm pretty sure my face looked exactly like Anakin's. That look of, oh, what? Because I also was nine years old and had no idea that was the big twist. This is also the scene that I'm pretty sure is responsible for making me aware of the handmaidens for the first time, uh, because you have Sabe, her, her royal decoy, and I just loved the idea of these girls who are highly intelligent and highly capable, who are willing to give everything not just for their planet but for their queen. 
Also, a really highly underrated part of this scene is that look that Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Qui -Gon exchange, because you know that Padawan just lost a bet, because later Qui-Gon's gonna be like, 10 credits, Obi-Wan. I told you so, because we all know that he absolutely already knew that it was Padme from the start. Which also, by the way, that puts all of their conversations on Tatooine before into a completely new context. But the main reason why this is my favorite scene is because of Padme herself, because this is Padme at her best. Her people elected her to lead the planet and be their queen because they trusted in her political skills and that she cared about the people. And she used those very political skills to convince the Gungans that yeah, they had to join together to defeat the Trade Federation. And at this moment in time, her personal safety had to come second. It's part of why I've always loved Padme and why I still do love her very much to this day. So in conclusion, while I may love the entirety of The Phantom Menace more or less, this one's my favorite scene because while lightsabers are cool, Padme being brave and doing awesome political things is even cooler. When Alex sent me a message uh, letting me know that him and Molly are going to be putting together this video in honor of The Phantom Menace's 20th anniversary, dear God almighty, I was eight when that movie came out, uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be an easy question to answer. What's your favorite scene in The Phantom Menace and why? Yeah, sure, that's an easy answer. I've got, a, I've got that memorized down pad, the pod race. It's what spoke to eight-year-old me, and it's what still speaks to 28-year-old me. Incredibly fast, violent, adrenaline-pumping insanity. That I played episode one racer on my N64 for hours on end, and I can sit there and watch the Blu-ray extended edition that's like, what, 10 or 12 minutes long or something like that. Uh, on repeat for days on end. And even on a technical standpoint, A, keep in mind, this is 1999. They're doing this stuff in the 90s. Yeah, all of that CGI is relatively, quote, easy to do um, nowadays, but this is back in 1999. And just the filmmaking aspect of it in general. I mean, there's, there's no music from the beginning of the race all the way until right when, if memory serves me correctly, right when the power coupling thing, whatever, pops off of Anakin's racer and his engine starts smoking uh, on that third lap. That, that's the first time that you start hearing music during that race. And they just let the sound team go wild. Let them give you the soundtrack. You know, David W. Collins is always banging on in the soundtrack show about how important the music is in a movie, but sound effects can, in certain scenes, do the same job as a traditional score. It can convey the feeling of the scene. What should you be feeling at this time? Uh, that's what soundtracks are designed to do. And you have the deep throaty bum 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 of the villain's theme, which is Sebulba's Racer. And honestly, it's probably a good thing because 18 year old me would have turned into Rats Tyrell in that cave if there was an actual track on the soundtrack that was the pod racer theme and that got embroiled into eight-year-old me's head and then I'm driving some, you know, my 1988 Mercury Cougar on the back road and it would have not been a good thing. But I love the pod race scene to death. There's even one shot. <sighs> Anyways, I'll let other people talk. You guys have a good one. Thanks for listening and may the force be with you. Take care. So happy anniversary to The Phantom Menace. Uh, I can't believe it's been 20 years. I watched this film so much as a kid. My favorite scene from it will definitely have to be Duel of the Fates. I know that's a very typical answer, but there's still just so much going on in this scene. I've always been a Jedi and lightsaber fan. I've loved lightsaber fighting and the moves Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Darth Maul were using in that. And I especially love Darth Maul. Like He's such a great villain and great... Uh, martial artists and you know the moves that Ray Park was bringing to that like remain iconic to this day and I myself have practiced a lot of martial arts and I love bojitsu which is using a staff and that's essentially what double blade lightsaber is so I was like really inspired by that as a kid and subsequently got more into martial arts and bojitsu specifically but 
besides that, it's just like such a great scene where you have no virtually no dialogue whatsoever and everything is being communicated by the characters' physical actions and their facial expressions. It's like, you know, I personally do have my critiques of the prequel trilogy's direction, George Lucas as a director, I'll be fully honest, but the direction in this specific scene is really, really on point. It's like some of the best in all of Star Wars. So definitely Duel of the Fates, like the direction, the action, the iconic score by John Williams. It's just like, it all comes together in such a great, great way. And it's one of the reasons I think the Phantom Menace is still held up as like, you know, in general in Star Wars fandom as a beloved classic. So yeah, happy anniversary Phantom Menace. Thank you for giving me Darth Maul with a uh, lightsaber staff that I still geek out about to this day. <laughs> Hello there. This is the Ad Ad Chat and happy 20th anniversary to the Phantom Menace. Qui-Gon Jinn and Darth Maul dueling on the sands of Tatooine is without a doubt my favorite scene in The Phantom Menace. I love how fierce Darth Maul is jumping off his speeder while simultaneously igniting his lightsaber and engaging a Jedi Master. This was the first really fierce lightsaber duel I had seen on the big screen and out of Star Wars. It had such a brutal nature to it compared to what I remembered from the other films when I first saw The Phantom Menace in theaters. Even the lightsabers themselves seem to have a beefier sound design in this specific scene, and the music perfectly matched how the fight was supposed to feel, in my opinion. As Darth Maul approached Anakin and Qui-Gon running towards their ship, the strings have the super sharp staccato cadence, and the notes themselves are a little dissonant until it erupts as the sabers collide. It honestly is an extremely well done sequence. Great visuals, great music, great pacing, and the right amount of tension with Qui-Gon Jinn, seeing just how powerful this Sith apprentice is. The Phantom Menace has a ton of fantastic sequences without a doubt, but for me, this one takes the cake. That last shot of Darth Maul as he stares at the ship flying away once Qui-Gon jumped on board was amazing to me when I was 12, and it's still amazing to me today. That is it for my favorite scene out of The Phantom Menace. Thank you, Alex and Molly, and may the Force be with you all. Hey everyone, it's Kieran here from the Star Wars Underworld. Just thought I'd play a bit of the old John Williams Jewel of the Fates music as I talk about my favourite moment from The Phantom Menace. Um, I mean, a lot of people look back at The Phantom Menace and think to themselves it's not the best of the Star Wars film sagas, but I think there's a lot still to like about this movie. Um, but I am going to go for the one that's probably the most popular, uh, the most popular moment from the film, which is that final duel uh, with Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Maul. Uh, in Naboo, I think the moment really epitomizes what we love about Star Wars. There's obviously action, um, there's emotion behind behind that particular duel as well, particularly with the death of Qui-Gon, which has a massive impact on um, the audience and also our characters, you know, namely Obi-Wan Kenobi, and, and how it has an impact on his journey throughout the rest of the films. Uh, but as a spectacle, I, I don't know if there's any other Star Wars lightsaber duel that can really compare to it. Um, and I'm not just being biased because I've got this Darth Maul t-shirt on, although it does help. Um, but I just think that Darth Maul as a villain really epitomised what the Sith were. You know, evil, uh, the way he looked, the way he fought as well was just... It was an exhilarating watch. Um, and it was just five minutes, I mean, in its entirety, and it's how long the duel is, is about five minutes of just pure uh, brilliance, really. Hi, it's Charlie from the Imperial State Podcast. My favourite moment in The Phantom Menace has to be the battle droids in the booze hangar when they're trying to stop Qui-Gon and Padme and the Queen from escaping, and it doesn't go well. Uh, we said the battle droids say, you're under arrest. But, you know, at least it tried, you know, it tried, it did its job. Poorly, I might add, but it, it, it tried to do something. Um, I love those droids. The B1s are the best, and that cemented them as one of my favourite Star Wars characters. So, thank you, Roger Roger. Hey, guys, it's Josh uh, from Star Wars Spelt Out here. Thanks for uh, 
getting me to come and give my thoughts about The Phantom Menace 20 years on. Uh, feels like only yesterday that we were uh, on the hype train. I had a friend who worked at KFC who got me one of those big Qui-Gon and Watto banners that was hanging in my bedroom. So my room smelt like fried chicken for about six months leading up to the movie, which was pretty exciting. You know how excited we all were about uh, Rick Ollie. He was going to be the new Han Solo. That worked out pretty well. Um, but my favorite scene, I mean, there's so many good scenes, but um, I mean, the desert lightsaber battle, uh, the battle of Naboo, the starfighter battle is awesome. But my favorite moment from Phantom Menace is one with uh, young Anakin, actually, where they're sitting around the table and um, and Qui-Gon sort of says, oh, I, you know, I didn't come here to free slaves, you know. And he just stops and he goes, I don't think you have. Why, why else would you be here? And for some reason, that little bit of acting, that is the best acting that Jake Lloyd does in the whole film, and it completely sells Anakin, you know, compassionate, you know, um, aware aware of the the wider world, gets an understanding of people as well, you know, obviously suspects. I mean, they seem spy the lightsaber that, that Qui-Gon has, but I think he already sort of knows what's going on. So I always find that, that scene and that moment really, really good in Phantom Menace. I think it sort of elevates above a lot of the other things going on in the film but i still think it's a great film you know some people love it more it's not my favorite of the bunch but it still means a lot and certainly uh is a encapsulation of a period of time you know when star wars was coming back and we're all getting excited again and um you know getting together with your friends and riding the hype train and and um being the cheerleader for Star Wars, as I definitely were, and midnight screenings and stuff. So I look back very fondly on it. I still pop it in every now and then and watch it. And um, yeah, here's to another 20 years. All right. Thanks, guys. I hope you all enjoyed that look back at The Phantom Menace. Happy birthday to episode one. And thank you to all of our friends who sent in clips to contribute to this. Of course, now we want to hear from you guys. What are your favorite scenes, characters, musical cues, sound effects, aspects of The Phantom Menace, leave that in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and consider checking... That's all right. And consider checking out our Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.